Hello everyone, my name is Nagura and today we'll explain the race to world first to you as if you were five years old. First off, who am I and why would you listen to me? Well, I've been playing WoW since it first came out and actually participated in the race to world first myself as a player, winning four different tiers. Afterwards, I moved on to become a full-time streamer and caster, and I've casted the race to world first for both Liquid and for Echo, not missing a race ever since it was officially broadcasted first. I decided to make this video because I was seeing many people ask similar questions about the race to world first, or I also know that there are completely new players or people that don't know WoW at all that want to join in on the hype of the race to world first. So let's start with the very, very basics first. So what is the race to world first? Well, it's an unofficial tournament, so a community-based event, and there are no prize pools. The one and only rule is, whichever guild kills the last boss of a newly released raid on Mythic difficulty first, wins the race. This usually takes the winning guild 9 to 10 days. During those 9 to 10 days, they play all day, only taking mandatory breaks for food and sleep. So why are people so invested in a race and why is it such a big thing? Well, the race has been a thing ever since the game was released all the way back in 2004 and the excitement of a new patch or a new expansion coming out has always been incredible for World of Warcraft players, drawing in loads of new players but also lots of returning players throughout the years. The last boss of the newly released raid is this big bad villain that we have been waiting to defeat for a long time, so people want to see that boss go down. But in the past, the race used to be this super secretive thing where the top guilds would try to hide as much as they possibly could, not streaming or showing anything at all. Once the last boss had been defeated by a guild, they would even wait to upload the kill video until five other guilds, or five guilds in total actually, had defeated the last boss. So the community had to wait for a long time sometimes to see the last boss go down officially. They did this because they didn't want to ruin the experience of the other top guilds in finding out strategies for themselves rather than seeing what the other guilds are doing in the video. So once the top guild started live streaming the race and letting the community watch, it was this long anticipated thing that people had wanted to see for such a long time. And it evolved a lot since the first ever streamed event a few years ago. Now we have players getting flown into a venue with this whole production crew, casters, background analysts, technicians, catering, and the whole community joining in as helpers as well. In fact, I am at a Race to World First venue right now as I'm casting for Echo this time around. I think another part of the appeal as a viewer is the fact that you can follow the race from start to finish with content being live streamed all day long. And if an EU guild is asleep, you can watch the NA guilds or the other way around. So you can get really invested in the race and the players, but also the casters, the crew and the production as you really follow them all day long. Now let me explain some terms we use in WoW and some basics to understand the race a bit better if you really don't play WoW at all. So what's a guild? <laughs> A guild is just a term we use in WoW to describe a team or a group of players. And what's a raid? A raid is an instance with several bosses in there. Usually you have to kill the bosses in a certain order and you can only access the last boss once all of the previous bosses are dead. Only the last boss matters for the race to world first. It does not matter who kills the previous bosses first. The reason for only the last boss mattering is the different weekly reset and access to the raid between regions, but I will explain that later. On top of the last boss always, or almost always, being the most difficult boss as well in the whole raid. And what does mythic difficulty mean? Well, each raid can be accessed in different difficulties. You fight the same bosses, but they do less damage, have less HP, and the abilities usually are also easier to handle on lower difficulties. They do drop the same items once you kill the bosses, but they are lower item level, so less powerful. On lower difficulties, the raid size determines how powerful the bosses are. So if I bring 10 players to the boss, they will have less health, but also drop less loot. If I bring 30 players, the bosses have more health, but also drop more items accordingly. On Mythic difficulty, the bosses are tuned for exactly 20 players. So bringing less players doesn't make sense, and you cannot bring more than 20. Now, what is an ID and resets? So once you kill a boss on Mythic difficulty, your character is locked to that specific instance until the weekly reset. The instance gets an identification number and each character entering that raid has to accept this ID and lock their character to it, contrary to how the lower difficulties work. This ID only resets once a week during the weekly reset, at the same day and time as all the other weekly activities reset in WoW. 
So for the North American region, this happens on Tuesday at 8 a.m. Pacific time, which is 5 p.m. Central European time. For the European region, the reset happens on Wednesday at 5 a.m. Central European time, which is 8 p.m. on Tuesday Pacific time. So there's a 12 hour difference in favor of the North American region. Why does the reset time matter so much for the race of all first? Well, the two top contenders for the race of all first are Echo and Liquid. Liquid is an NA-based guild and Echo is an EU-based guild. So the reset happening earlier for NA also means that Liquid can access the Mythic Raid 12 hours earlier. Of course, being able to access the Raid earlier is a benefit for the NA guilds as this is a time-based race. But there are also negative aspects that come with starting early that affect each Raid differently or each race differently, making it a pretty unpredictable playing field each time. Some examples of downsides for starting early would be, for example, a longer maintenance. So because they are the first region to get the patch applied, there are usually longer downtimes for NA servers, cutting into their weekly reset time, turning their seven day reset into a six day and X hours reset, while EU usually gets the full seven day reset because they're faster at applying the patch for EU. Many times bosses also have to be adjusted by Blizzard during the race, either bugs occur that have to be fixed or tuned has to be adjusted to make the bosses killable, for example reducing a boss's health points or lowering the amount of damage certain abilities do. The reason why these changes have to happen is sometimes Blizzard will purposefully tune a boss a little bit higher than they think they need to, just because they don't want that guild to get there and just one-shot the boss when it was supposed to be a more difficult boss. So usually they tune the bosses a little bit higher with more HP and more damage, and then they'll adjust them as they go. They of course try to hit the mark, but when in doubt, they'll go with more health and adjust it later. These changes to hotfixes get applied to both regions simultaneously, but the guild that spent more time on the pre-nerf version of the boss probably also wasted more time on it. And because NA starts earlier, they usually are also the guild to waste more time on it. Additionally, starting early also means the other guilds get the opportunity to see what worked and what didn't work when it comes to boss strategy. So EU guilds tend to kill earlier bosses in fewer attempts because they can avoid the mistakes the NA guilds made and copy what did work. Usually the EU guilds manage to catch up to the NA guilds at some point during the reset because of this. But the closer we get to the 7 day mark of the race, the more problematic the different reset times actually becomes because the weekly reset gives characters a big power boost because of different kinds of rewards you can get, for example, the weekly vault, including a very powerful item of your choice, and additional gear from re-killing those mythic bosses from your now reset raid idea. So if there was a boss you just barely didn't manage to kill the day before the reset, you would now have a much easier time killing that same boss because of that boost in player power. So if two guilds are fighting the last boss and both of them are very close to killing it, then the guild that would get the additional power from the reset would be able to kill the boss first and make the race very unfair and unexciting. So Blizzard usually tries to tune the bosses in such a way that the race lasts around 9 to 10 days, which would be well past the first weekly reset, making sure that the EU guilds have enough time to catch up. For most of the recent races, haven't been majorly impacted by the weekly reset being different, and I hope it stays this way for this and for future races as well. Even though we all hope for a global reset, of course, and a global release of the raid at the same time. Blizzard, please, at some point. <laughs> Now let's talk about splits and the gearing process for the race. So to be able to kill the last boss, the guilds have to farm as much player power as possible. This gear usually gets farmed through various different ways, depending on the patch. One of the things that you can see the race to first guilds do that almost no one else does is splits. Raid splits means you are killing certain bosses on either normal or heroic difficulty, so not a mythic, not on the most difficult difficulty that matters, and you see them kill them multiple times, splitting their main characters into as many different raids as possible to allow them to get items they need. The amount of items you get from a boss gets determined by the players in the raid, as I mentioned earlier. So they will fill the raid with 30 players, but only a few of those 30 players are actually main characters they want to use in their mythic raid. So those few main characters will get funneled all the items from the boss, the rest of the characters are just fillers and won't receive any items. They're just there to increase the amount of items the boss drops. So to give an example, let's say five of your players you want to use in a mythic raid all want the same weapon. This weapon drops from a boss in a raid. 
So if you would kill that boss with those five players in the same raid, and the weapon actually drops, then you would have to decide which of those five players gets the weapon. But if you divide those five players into five different raids, each filled with 29 other characters that do not need the weapon, then all five players would get the weapon if it drops in each raid. And that's the idea of split raids. Additionally, the guilds started to have their raiders create mirror characters. This means they prepare multiple characters of the same class to decrease the effect of RNG. So even though your main characters get dedicated split raids with all the loot being funneled to them, they could just get really unlucky and not have any items dropped that they would actually need. Because the bosses have a larger loot table than the items that actually drop on kill. So these mirror characters give them multiple chances on getting the items. So for example, let's take Jinji, a mage player from Echo. He might have five different mages that potentially all are his main character. He doesn't know which one he's maining before the split raids. Then they do a split raid with Jinji Mage 1. And if he gets really unlucky, then you take Jinji Mage 2 and do another split raid with that mage. If that mage is unlucky again, you go with mage number 3 until you're happy with the loot the character received and then you're going to be choosing that one to be your main character that you're then going to use to do the mythic raid with. But doing all these split raids cuts into your time you can spend fighting bosses on mythic. So these split raids have to be as time efficient as possible. They usually run multiple raids at the same time. But because they know they will need to farm this gear at some point, doing the reset anyway, because otherwise they won't be able to kill the last boss, they will prefer to farm everything at the start of the idea to make sure they are as geared as possible so they need the least attempts they can on the mythic bosses, wasting as little time as possible. If they would go into mythic straight away, they might wipe on the earlier bosses a couple of times here and there because they don't have their maximum item level and that would just be a waste of time. So that's why they're doing the split raids and the gearing process first. Additionally, doing split raids and other gearing processes first allows you to see what the other guilds do in the mythic raids and potentially save some time by copying strategies or avoiding mistakes that they made. Now let's talk about the amount of players involved in the race well first. So usually they have around 30 main raiders, two main tanks of course, five to six healers, and the rest are damage dealers, usually divided between melee players and range players. But almost all players are able to play multiple different classes to be able to flex into different class compositions depending on the boss and on the damage tuning. Additionally, they have a main shot caller or raid leader. This is currently Max for Liquid and Scribe for Echo. They will watch the point of view of another player and call out mechanics and the flow of the fight without actually playing themselves. This will allow them to focus a lot more on the callouts and give them a lot more overview while not having to think about their own gameplay. They also have different kinds of players taking over the role of analysts. For example, someone to map out healer cooldowns for specific fights and calling out when to use what during attempts. Other players checking locks constantly and figuring out what they can optimize, thinking about strategies, thinking about things that they can do differently on each boss fight, of course. They have multiple programmers working on weak auras, boss mod timers, and other helpful programs to use to help them out with various different aspects of the race. They have dedicated players to organize splits and loot distribution as well. And they have players focusing on the guild's gold they have to use to afford all of the consumables, crafted gear, and other costs. Not to mention everyone working on the venue and the broadcast, organizing all the players, casters and crew flying in and staying for an undefined amount of time can be very challenging. Now the last thing I want to do is explain the interface a bit. If you're new to WoW or haven't played it at all, you might be very confused on what you're even looking at. Unfortunately, user interfaces in World of Warcraft are very individual. You can change both the position and style of all of the overlaid information, so they might look very different and also be in very different positions from one player to another. I will try to give you some pointers on what you should be looking out for and why. In my opinion, the most important things to find and to keep an eye on are number one, damage meters. No, just kidding. <laughs> number one, the boss health and other enemies' health. So the three main ways of displaying enemy health values is the target frame, boss frame, and nameplates. The target frame displays the health bar of the friendly or enemy a player is currently targeting. For damage dealers and tanks, this will usually be the boss or other important targets. A lot of players have their target frame around the middle of their screen, opposite side of the player frame, which is their character's health and resource bar displayed. 
The other way of potentially seeing the boss's health is by looking for the boss frames. These frames always display the boss's health. If there's multiple bosses, it will also display multiple boss's health. And players many times have them positioned on the top right quadrant of their screen somewhere. And lastly, you can see the boss's health through the nameplates. These are health bars attached to the enemy models and follow them around. Number two, the raid frames. To see how good a try is going, you want to see the health of all 20 players in the raid and see if all of them are still alive. The position of the raid frame is very individual and could be anywhere on the screen, but you can easily spot them because it's a large clump of bars with the player names on them. They can either fill horizontally or vertically, have various different settings on colors and style as well. Number three, other important information. Available battle rests, for example. So in World of Warcraft, you can revive players during a boss fight, but you only have one battle rest available initially, and you gain more the longer you are in combat with the boss. In a mythic raid, you gain an additional battle rest every four and a half minutes. The amount of rests available is usually displayed on player screens, but also in various different ways, unfortunately. Some of them have just a number displaying 0, 1, 2, 3, basically showing the available rests, and then a countdown to indicate when the next rest is available. For damage dealers, this display is usually around their damage meter somewhere. Then Bloodlust or Heroism, this is basically a big damage cooldown in World of Warcraft. Every 10 minutes you can use it and it gives the whole raid a large amount of haste, increasing everyone's damage by a big margin. You can see a debuff on each player, indicating how long they won't be able to be affected by the benefit of Bloodlust. The debuffs are usually displayed top right next to the minimap underneath the buffs. Other than that, there will be loads of other information on each player's screen, showing boss timers for certain abilities, icons and sound alerts to tell the player if they have to react to a certain boss's ability, showing their own important cooldowns somewhere for damage but also defensive abilities, showing other players' cooldowns of very important raid CDs like damage reductions for the raids or utility like speed boosts. And there will be damage meters and healing meters. This will indicate how much damage and healing each player does throughout the current boss attempt. One thing to keep in mind here, mythic boss fights, especially the later ones, tend to be very complex with various different faces and different types of ads and targets. So each player's offensive cooldowns will potentially be allocated to different parts of the fights. Additionally, some players' jobs might be to deal AoE damage, so area of effect damage, so doing damage to multiple different targets, while other players' main purpose is to do single target damage to the boss, potentially, resulting in overall damage numbers not necessarily being important data points. So just because someone is number one on damage doesn't mean that they're, that they're playing much better than the other players or that their class is much better than the other classes. It's basically what I'm trying to say. There's so much more I could explain and talk about in more detail, but I do want this video to be not too long. <laughs> but if you enjoyed this video and it helped you out, definitely let me know in the comments below and I can continue this series in the future and maybe do more videos like this where I talk in detail about the result first. Make sure you also remember to subscribe to the channel if you enjoyed this video and check out my stream over at twitch.tv slash Negura. Thank you very, very much for watching. Have an amazing rest of your day. I will see you at the Race to the World first broadcast and have a great day. Bye.